Um, you know, you're talking about um, JavaScript on the server side. Six years ago, there was a big change in the way we thought about JavaScript when the Ajax revolution started. And we're now starting to see a similar change in the role of JavaScript um, going back to the server. But this is not a new idea. We first saw server side JavaScript in 1996. That stayed out of the product called LiveWire. Uh, unfortunately, it failed. It was a PHP like. Uh, with blocking I.O., very much like everything else. Um, and that turns out not to be the best way to provide service. So um, now we're very excited about um, systems like Node.js, which is based on Google's VA engine, uh, which is bringing an event-driven return-based execution model um, to server-side uh, implementations. And this looks like a big thing. So, uh, Node.js allows you to implement a web server in a JavaScript connected. Uh, Node.js is basically a high-powered uh, event model. It um, executes events very, very um, It does I follow correct um, in that every programming language since Fortran has done I.O. Uh, lock. And it turns out that's the wrong way to do it. We want to be not logging. And Node.js gets the right. So you would see we're calling a file system, uh, asking to read a file. We pass the callback method or callback function, which will be called the result. We don't pay for the result. That turns out to be the right thing. Everything in Node.js is on blocking, which is great. Uh, that's not quite true. There's some uh, synchronous functions, um, and there's required uh, neither of those block. I think that's the problem. So one of the really nice things about working with Node.js and working with YUI is that because YUI 3 runs in Node.js, you can run exactly the same application on both ends of the network. It can be running on the server or you can be running on the browser. Same code. Um, there are lots of reasons for why you want to do that. It might be that you've got an application which takes a long time to get started in the server and in the browser. So you can do the first page view in the server um, and send that to the browser so the users have something to look at while the rest of the data is being assembled. Or you might be working with um, old-fashioned browsers like IE6, which do not do the modern things. So in that case, you can run everything on the server side and then simply send data to the um, The uh, thing that makes this possible is that um, um, it uses turn-based processing. Turn-based execution is a very polite way of scheduling uh, work within, within a process because everything waits for its turn and when it gets its turn, uh, it will not be interrupted until its turn is finished. Um, the, the way this happens is we have callback functions which are called as a result of external events or um, user actions or the taking of the clock. The nice thing about a based system is that we don't need threads. Um, so there are no races, there are no deadlocks, none of the hazards are kind of a threat. But it requires that you obey the law of terms. The law of terms says that you never wait, you never block, and you finish fast. This is a different uh, style of programming than we see in, in uh, more old fashioned systems. So in a turn based system, Nothing can ever block, not even I go. Um, so it means that you can't do polling. There are systems where um, you'll sit in a loop and you wait for something to happen. You cannot do that in a turn based system. Instead, you register a callback and so you get notified when the thing actually occurs. This is how browsers work. The browser has always worked this way. And it turns out this is how surveys should work as well. And we're now uh, coming back to this. Now, not everything can run well in a turn-based system. Uh, for example, if you have something that's going to be doing a lot of computation, it might be uh, that it cannot finish fast, and so you have to, to do something else. But even with a turn-based system, you have two alternatives. One is a technique called iteration, where you can break for a long-running task into multiple turns. Uh, each turn, as it finishes, will schedule the um, execution of the next turn. Um, and that will allow it to um, uh, play the light. The system remains responsible 
not one house they still take a long time, but none of its terms will take a lot of time, so it's okay. The other is to move the house into a separate process, um, like a, a work, who will do some great uh, work and promoting uh, workers. Um, so this is important because grants are the systems programming grants are necessary to move. In application programming, threads are just key. And so we don't want to be doing threads at the application, but it's too dangerous. Um, threads provide a deceptively simple model of currency, but it comes with a lot of uh, complexity because threads are subject to races and deadlocks. So uh, people for years have been wishing that we could have threads in JavaScript. And it turns out it's never going to happen. It's a good thing that it's never going to happen. Let me show you why. So um, here I've got a program that's going to have two threads. Each of the threads is going to try to um, add a letter to an array. Now because um, in thread systems you can't guarantee the order of execution, one result might be A and then B, or another result might be B and A. This is a, a race, but this is not a, a problematic race. Another race that could occur in this program is we get a rate containing just A, or a rate containing just B. You might look at the code for hours and try to figure out what happened to the other letter. So um, the other letter was lost uh, to data error due to racing. So um, when you uh, append something to the end of an array, what's really happening is something more complicated. We're looking at the current length, we're looking at the new index. If the new index is greater than or equal to the length, then we have one of the Now, if we have two threads that are trying to do the same thing, we cannot guarantee what order um, these steps get um, interviewed. So one possible interpretation of this program is that um, both threads get the current length, and both will assign these to that length, and then both will increment um, these in the same length. Um, and so that is how one of the letters can get lost. Again, this is a really, really difficult thing to do. But, um, unfortunately, in the browser, we never have to deal with this kind of stuff. Uh, it's impossible to have application integrity when we're subject to racing issues. And races will occur any time you have threads that are competing in a re-modified race. One alternative um, is to never do read modified writes. There are some systems that avoid having any side effects and communication. That turns out to be really difficult in applications, so that's how a viable alternative uh, turns work much better. Um, so another um, thing we can do in threads is take advantage of visual exclusion. Um, at various times, we can call different things, set force monitors, rendezvous synchronization, uh, which prevents uh, two pieces of code from executing at the same time. This used to be operating system stuff, but it was turned into application level stuff, partly because applications are now using networks, and networks uh, impose very long delays. Um, and also because of the multi core problem, because we don't know how to make CPUs go faster anymore, we're making more CPUs. Expecting the application developers to take advantage of that new task. It turns out we don't know how to do that. That's not all the problem. The other problem we have when we do mutual exclusion is deadlock. So here we have two threads, Gaston and Alphonse. Uh, each is programmed to wait for the other to stand up before it will stand up. Uh, that'll never happen, so they're deadlock. This is a real world example of deadlock. Uh, this is an uh, intersection in South Paulo, Brazil, about two. Blocks from the Yahoo office there. Each of these cars is a thread waiting for the car in front of it to resume before it can resume. Um, let's see, I'm going to do another time. I think I'll skip this. The whole procedure call turns out to be a really bad idea. Right? Ask me later why it is. Um, so, turn based programs avoid all of these problems. Um, it's unfamiliar to non JavaScript programmers because it's a new model. But it's very familiar to JavaScript programmers because this is how the wall is done. Um, so moving to the server is actually going to be pretty complicated. Uh, someone asked earlier if there's going to be a test, and it's right now. Okay, so here I've got a uh, function called 
from E takes an arc a parameter of zero, which accepts a null. Um, I set an array, or variable x to an array, I call from E passing x. What is the result now of x? Uh, anybody think it's null? Anybody think it's uh, an empty array? Okay, not, not a lot of answer on that. Um, it turns out to be an empty array because what Funky gets is not the variable, it gets the, um, the contents of the variable. Um, here's another one. I'm going to swap two things, um, but this swap function actually doesn't accomplish anything because it doesn't see the names of the variables as in one. It only sees their values. So, uh, understanding that, we want to make a function that will put a value into the variable um, after some computation measure. So the worst way to do that would be to use an eval to construct an assignment statement that is going to assign something to that. Not only is that really evil, it's going to be illegal in the S5 script in all versions of the language going forward. So you don't want to be doing that. Um, and equally evil is assigning to a global variable indexed through um, the window out there. We don't want to be doing that either. So an alternative to that would be that we pass not just the name of the variable, but also an object in which that variable is going to occur. So I change it from uh, storing it into a variable to storing it into a property of an object. Um, this is much better, but it's still not good in that um, it gives the do it function too much capability. Um, in addition to storing something to that property, it can do anything it wants to the rest of the object. We don't want to be able to do that. Um, so the correct way to do that is to pass a function to do it. And then once you do it has the result, you can simply call that function. And the function is then responsible for taking care of it. This actually has some very nice security properties uh, because uh, do it cannot abuse the function. You can't open the function up and get its private data. And the uh, function cannot abuse do it um, the way you validate it. Um, and in this model, uh, that function that we pass is a callback. Callbacks are great. Callbacks provide temporal isolation so we can have events on uh, different turn boundaries. Uh, we use them for event handlers, timers. They are lightweight, powerful, and expressive. And JavaScript does a good job of enabling these things because its uh, functions are so powerful. Um, so, uh, I've got when I do a function there, I call it, pass a callback, and I call callback uh, when the thing is finished. And, and that works really well. Um, and the thing that I pass it could be a function which will then assign something to the variable, assign something to a property there. Um, but you might be thinking, well, that's too much work. I don't want to have to write a function every time I want to store the result of something. So I can generalize that. I can write a function which will return a function. Um, so I only have to write that pattern once, and then I can call it as many times as I want to produce the functions that I want. Um, so that makes it easier. And I can go meta on this stuff. Um, here I'm making uh, stores that store to um, any object. I can make a store maker that will store things into a particular object. Um, and once I make one of these stores, then I can call it to make functions which will make things for me. So we can get, um, make more and deeper functions in order to make life easier for us. Now one way that uh, do it could still abuse us is it could um, call the function, the callback more than once. Um, so if we want to be able to restrict it, um, we can create a new function called once and we will pass a callback function to it and it will return a callback function which can only be called once. And we can then um, pass the result of once to do it and do it can call it once but no more than that. So now we're starting to be able to close callbacks where we have functions which take callbacks returning callbacks. I might have several things I want to have that. Um, so I can um, have a sequence function which will take a number of functions as arguments and return a single function, which will do all of those things. And so that can pose several results, which I can then pass to uh, the do it function. Um, 
another model might be um, I want to be able to invoke something. So instead of saying that you can call something once, I will determine the minute you don't want to call something. You can call it as many times as it wants prior to that and not happen. So in this case, I return two functions. One is the callback that can be invoked, and the other is the invoker function, which will cause the other callback to become a mirror. Um, so this shows uh, an example of uh, creating a sequence of scores um, which can only be called once. So I can compose these things because functions can cause fun call functions in, in the real term in a nice and nice way. I can build very complicated expressions simply by passing functions together. Um, now when we get to the server, we get some patterns in callbacks that we don't see in the browser. For example, in building a page, we might want to call 20 different web services and wait for all of the results to come back and go to the page and send it out. On doing PHP, you have to call each of those things serially. Now it's possible in PHP to call it in parallel, but that's work and it's hard. Nobody else can do hard in PHP, so you don't do that. So you just wait for each one. But in JavaScript, it's all on the event pointed, so it's easy. Uh, but the complicated part of it is then synchronizing with them all 20 of those things finish. And that's a particular program. The other problem is um, sometimes you'll have several services that each directly depend on the next one. And so you don't want to have um, equally nested event handlers because that turns out to be a little rough and difficult on the game. Um, so, I want to solve these problems, and JavaScript gives me the uh, power to do that. So, I'm going to start by creating a new abstraction that I call the requester. So, when I want to do something, um, I will create a function that will do it for me. Um, and the function will take the async function, uh, which will be a fallback that it should apply. Um, and it will then call some request service, you know, like the XLHD. Request or item or something like that, passing it a parameter um, and also passing it a callback function. The callback function um, uh, will receive the result and do something interesting with it and call the same function. Um, and um, it will also take an error mark. error mark. The reason for that is that event handling um, doesn't work, I'm sorry, exception handling doesn't work across terms. Because at the end of every turn, the stack goes to zero. And what throw does is unwind the stack. So there's no way to throw something into a previous turn. But we've already got a callback function for the uh, successful result. So we can also pass uh, the error condition. And that uh, takes care of the error result. Now you might be looking at this and write, oh, this is too much work. It used to be I just called something. But now I have to write two functions in order to call something. Um, and you go, yeah, that would be right, so we should make that simple. And so the answer to that is, we'll write another function. And so what that function will do is we'll pass it our, our object parameters, and it will return the function that calls the function that calls the function. So we don't have to do that stuff except once. Um, and then from that point on, it's easy. We just call the request maker for the parameters, and we're all done. And you might be asking, okay, so, What's the benefit of that? Well, the benefit is that we can now compose these things. So I can have a parallel function. And the parallel function can take an array of these requester functions. And it will then call all the requester functions immediately and get them all started, all 20 of them, however many there are. And when they all come back, it will then call them the same uh, callback to let you know it's all done. And while it's doing that, it can also do some useful things for us like uh, process timeouts. You know, so if any of those don't finish by a certain time, we can error out and, and not just do the end. Or I could have a sequence function. And what the sequence function will do is take another array of requested uh, functions, and it will call each one individually, passing it the result of the previous one. So it's sort of a reduce function. Um, and so this becomes an easy solution to the I, I want to call a bunch of things and have the results dependent on each other. Or another possible result would be to have a, a map function, which will return an array of all the results of all the requesters. 
Um, but I can go even further. I can now have functions which return functions which are the loops things, uh, which gives me another uh, level of, of composability. So I can have um, several sequences, and I can take all the sequences and then process all of those in parallel. Um, so there are a number of other attempts at, at solving this problem, which are also very elegant. There's a very nice paper out of the University of Maryland about arrows. Um, arrows are a very nice sort of nomadic uh, way of, of structuring stuff. Uh, there's the adaptive extensions of JavaScript being developed at Microsoft, which is brilliant, where they're taking also the event driven uh, uh, models or reversing the uh, link and making it very nice. It, it's not adequately documented yet, so I, I don't know how to use it, but it, it looks to be doing it. Um, there's also um, a Judge Next Bath, which is just amazing. And he's got these little functions, which take functions and return functions and just um, cascades on um, invocations. It's this amazing, interesting, weird, wonderful thing. Also, completely undocumented, so it's not viable. Um, ultimately, what I hope to do is to have a beauty context to the issue, uh, take these and other proposals and uh, rank them and decide which is the most expressive, which is the most elegant, and we'll decide, that, okay, that's how we should do the server side of the I don't think we're quite ready to do that in fashion yet, but um, I'm confident that we may have some very 